Well, all right, everybody out here all over the world. Hail and welcome back to another Random Heathen Ramblings podcast. My name is Jesse. Thank you for listening. Thank you for watching and uh, all that fun stuff. To all my YouTube members, the video format, it's all you. Uh, you help make this possible. And I want to say a very special thank you uh, to those of you out here that are doing that. For those of you that are listening, your support is always greatly appreciated. You are also the reason why um, I do this. But if you want to get in on the action and you want to be a part of the uh, video formatting or the video version, I should say, of the podcast, then check the show notes um, of the podcast for the way that you can become a member of Midgard Musings on YouTube and be a part of the video stuff. Um, you also get some added incentives or perks as well. Uh, so check the show notes for that. For all those that are watching this, you already know the deal. And if you want more people to be a part of it as well, the more the merrier. Uh, please let your friends uh, know about it. So um, as always, you know, guys and gals out there, check the, for the video uh, watchers, check the description area for the Linktree link uh, for all the ways that you can uh, additionally support Midgard Musings, follow all the social media for uh, Midgard Musings that's out there. Um, don't forget to, uh, if you want to have your voice heard on the Midgard Musings podcast, you have a couple of ways to do that uh, through the podcast listening platforms. You have the option to send a voice message. I know it's anchor.fm slash Midgard Musings has a voice message option. You are limited to a one minute limit on that. Um, and I'm pretty sure that it's available on other podcast listening platforms as well. So without further ado, let's get into the podcast today with our intro. We've got a special guest coming on here in just a little bit. Uh, so let's get to it. So that got that out of the way. Thank you all again. Um, but yeah, like I said uh, before, the, the main way to have your voice heard on the Midgard Musings podcast is again, uh, send, your, send your voice message in, um, have your voice heard. We can talk about things that are on your mind. Uh, if you have any questions, feel free to do that as well. Uh, there is also uh, the Google Voice Midgard Musings um, podcast hotline, which is 615-671-9832. If you have uh, a question and you want to have more time than just that one minute limit, you know, to, to say your piece, uh, offer a suggestion for a future podcast episode, maybe a thought that you had about something to do with heathenry or other stuff, um, you've got that option as well. So all that information, again, is... Um, in the show notes of the podcast and is also down in the description of this video. So it uh, should be a pretty fun episode today. Um, gonna be going to be bringing on um, a guest, um, Emily. She's um, associated with Eric Shervin, at least in some sort of way. You'll know more about her when she comes on here in just a minute. Uh, have her explain, you know, some things and uh, get into some ran random ramblings uh, with her and also talk about what Crow mentioned last week in his voicemail that he left uh, in the previous episode. If you haven't uh, listened to it or watched it yet, just check it out. Um, but he was talking about the, uh, and we'll probably, like I said, we'll, we'll, we'll revisit that here in just a minute. We'll, we'll re-listen to what Crow had to say um, about the, Feelings that some people can have sometimes when um, they feel like they've lost uh, connection with the gods or they feel like the gods are no longer present um, in their lives and that sort of thing. So that's going to be what we 
kind of get into today and see what else happens as well. So we're going to go ahead and bring uh, Emily in here, give her a chance to uh, say her piece and stuff. So let's welcome Emily. All right, so here we are, and uh, hail and welcome to Emily. Emily, introduce yourself for the for the guests and the viewers, if you don't mind. Alrighty, hello everyone. My name is Emily. I'm a part of River Pine Kindred from Texarkana, Texas. Thank you, Jesse, for having me. Yeah, thank you for being here, Texarkana. Uh, I always thought that uh, it was like you couldn't decide whether you wanted to be in Arkansas or Texas, and you just decided to. <laughs> go become Texarkana is that because isn't yeah, there like doesn't it sit close to the state line or am I am I off on my geography yeah, it's considered the Arklatex okay Arklatex so you never yeah, go with other other yeah, words it's <laughs> Arkansas Louisiana and Texas where they all touch yes and, so, and Texarkana is considered like the twice as nice city because there's a border lining of them so we have the states that touch that make it twice as nice so. gotcha gotcha little little bit of uh a, a, a best of all the worlds might might could say i guess it's been a while since i've been out that way i used to travel all the time and uh you know louisiana texas was a big area that we would cover for the work that i was doing at the time so we would hit you know all kinds of those regions, you know, usually we could spend a week and and not even leave Texas, just from all the all the territory that we would cover. Yeah, Texas, so. you could drive 10 hours and still be in Texas. It doesn't matter oh, yeah. if you go north, east, or south, or west, yep. you're going to be in Texas for 10 hours. Yep. I, I remember many times traveling cross country and getting, uh, like, my partner who at the time would, would be driving and he would you know, we would pick up somewhere in like El Paso um, and we had no stops and I would lay down to sleep and I'd wake up and I'm like, where are we? And he's like, still Texas, man. Like, <laughs> you know, we got like another 300 miles to go before we get out of this. <laughs> I was like, dang. Yeah. Before the pandemic right. happened, I used to do a lot of traveling and stuff like that for the kindred because we would meet other kindreds and like different places in Texarkana or we'd, you know, drive to Dallas or we would drive down even further towards the Waco area to meet different kindreds. And we would go right. all the way up to Arkansas and hot springs, or we mm -hmm. would go to Shreveport, Louisiana to meet over there for the kindred that's over there. I think I've met, met like, I don't know, like maybe six different kindreds since our kindred got started two years ago. So I got used to traveling before the pandemic happened and that got shut down like quick. So Right. Yeah. Yeah. We've been talking about, you know, that whole thing, how how this global pandemic has affected heathenry as a whole. But uh, people like in person type stuff, you know, of these virtual connections, these virtual meetings, it, it, it kind of it fills a gap, I feel, but it doesn't it doesn't replace the authenticity and, and the feel of, you know, sitting across a table from somebody sharing a drink, a meal, you know, that that type of thing. You, you can't. You can't yeah, uh, like, replace that. In it's your, like weaving frith virtually. <laughs> yeah, which is a bit oxymoronic, or, or uh, if that's the right word, but I don't even, I don't know what your take is on it. Uh, I think we've had, because that's the other thing too I wanted to mention real, real briefly is uh, I mentioned in the intro, uh, we, know, we know each other through Eric Shervin um as a, as a mutual friend and, and and you've known eric for i don't know how long but that's how we know each other so this this whole like weaving of frith thing that like you can't do that in a virtual long distance like frith is a very an in-person sort of thing so. yeah it's been actually interesting because like since I've gotten to stay at home more and I was homeschooling my kids when we have our free time, I would, you know, bump around on Facebook and checking stuff out, like going to other pages and the, like the Texas area pages. And there was a lot of new people coming out of the woodworks where there's the people, you know, that's been there for years. Cause I met Eric like two years ago and mm. I went to one of his meetups and whatnot. <laughs> he was one of my first stops <clears throat> when I was meeting other kindreds and, you know, 
it was, you know, very laid back, very friendly and everything. And I've just noticed since the pandemic shut down, like everybody's so busy dealing with the pandemic. We don't really have time to really chit chat with each other anymore or, you know, yeah. our usual friends that we hang out with. We don't get to because we're all stuck at home or if we're not stuck at home, we're busy playing catch up from what the pandemic did to everybody. And all these new people are coming out of the woodworks because I guess I don't know if they watched like Vikings too much or The Last Kingdom mm-hmm. or it was just their calling happening, but everybody was just coming out of the woodwork. And like one of the pages I go to, it's like every day, there's like three or four new people. And they're like, Hey, I'm from this area in Texas. I'm looking for such and such. Let's do a meetup or hang out. Yeah. And I'm just like, yeah, I'm, I'm nowhere near y'all. Like you're like 10 hours away from me. Cause most people are getting real farther down South in Texas compared to the East Texas area. So. Right. Well, for anybody that's, you know, listening and watching, because you know these 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 podcasts go out uh, on multiple podcast listening platforms, and then they also get released um, on YouTube for the members of, of the channel. So um, it's good to know where you are, and if anybody is in that area and wants to connect, it's uh, you guys have a Facebook page group, I think. Yeah. Yeah, you got yeah, both, have, right? You got um, the River Pine Kindred. Yes, we have the River Pine Kindred page, and then we also have the Arklatex Heathen page, which I post mainly just historical stuff, and you post your podcasts and videos, and Eric posts, and a couple of other people, like I have a lady from Denmark that she posts all the new historical findings for anything that's like heathen, yeah. Viking, anything you can find, and I just met her like a couple months ago, and she's just great. She's an archaeologist from some place in Denmark at a museum somewhere and I'm like yeah I'm like I want to meet more people like that (laughs) yeah bring something to the table right she's really sweet awesome yeah so you know everybody listening people bring to the table to the group that they can get going yeah for sure um that and that's that can be tough um I think sometimes especially when you know whether you admin or, or manage any sort of uh online platform forum you know, um, just getting that level of engagement because you can sit there and post stuff all the time and then not have anybody say or comment any things. I find that happens a lot in in, in our group, the uh, Middle Tennessee Heathens, uh, which again, for anybody listening or watching, if you're in the Middle Tennessee area, uh, it'll be annotated um, or added to the show notes and in the description. But Middle Tennessee Heathens, if it's all right with you, Emily, I'll, I'll put information out for the people as well for uh, okay, Arklatex. And, and River Pine Kindred just so way, that way they know, you know, what's out there and what's available. Um, you seem pretty welcoming, uh, even if, you know, like I'm nowhere near the region of your, you know, geographically, but, you know, we, uh, we appreciate the, the, the open arms, <laughs> welcome as it were, yeah. uh, even over long distance. So I didn't realize, I thought you might've known Eric for a lot longer and then just a couple well, years. I, I think that's Eric about as long as I have. For like two years. So. Gotcha. Yeah, I think I met him through one of his videos. I found him on I found him on YouTube, and um, uh, I guess found the Word Weaver group on on Facebook, Word Weaver Productions. And yeah, I don't even remember where I met. Sent him a friend request. Yeah, yeah. like I know it was on Facebook, but like it may have been on like the East Texas page or. Yeah. Um, the Texas Heathen page. Yeah. I don't really know because like I have so many pages that I'm on that I post all the stuff for the River Pine Kindred because everybody seems to enjoy it because uh, the posts that I do are more poetic and it talks about like the holidays or you know what a gothi or a gidia is or like what a hearth mm. mother is and you know like I just post poetic stuff and tell about the holidays just to get give people an insight and I think I was on one of the pages that in Texas and I found and came across him. And I was like, hey, I was like, do y'all do meetups where y'all are at? I'd like to meet other people and close by. Because Eric's like two hours away from me, I think. Oh, wow. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Y'all are spread out. Yeah. It's spread out all over the place a little bit, I see. Okay. Well, that's cool. It's good to know you uh, a little bit more um, in that sort of way. So thanks for filling in the gaps. You're um, so yeah, today's today's episode, uh, you know, again, thank you for, for coming on here. Um, on, on such kind of a short notice, you know, usually I actually had a, a guest lined up um, for this week and there were some conflicts that came up. So um, otherwise, it's just me talking to me, 
at the time. So it's always nice to have a guest. But yeah, we um, one of the things that uh, we were going to talk about today or that you wanted to, to add to the discussion today was kind of a uh, writing off of the coattails of last week's episode where I made mention of this uh, the great this this Odin and the Great Flood or or, or fl great floods in various religions, including Germanic, heathery, Norse, Norse paganism, whatever. And we and we uh, or I alluded to the uh, story of uh, Emir being killed by Odin, Billy, and Bay, and his blood causing a flood. And you actually have a story um, in a book that you were telling me about. That yes. kind of goes into some detail. Uh, and yeah, why don't you yeah, tell us a little bit about that? I'm sorry. I'm trying to get used to the, the delay and the, the little monitor thing. Um, no worries. This is a children's book that I read to my kids at night. And it's of the Norse gods and giants. And it's an old book from like the 1960s. And they made another copy of it in the 1970s. And it tells the story of the gods and the creation and all the little different things. And it's got wonderful pictures in it. Like, it's just, it's just really great. Like, you could see, like, the Yigur still tree, and it gives all the in-depth about it and stuff. It's just really yeah. nice. Like, my really, kids love it. And they really ask me, you know, questions afterwards and stuff. Nice. Yeah, so it caters to the, you know, capturing the children's attention with the, with the imagery and stuff. That's yeah. awesome. Yeah, and the adults love it too, like, because it kind of just gives, because it uses some of the old gods' names in it, and it's really mm -hmm. interesting because you don't get to see, like, some of the older gods' names used and stuff, because, like, over here, you know, we have, like, Odin, Valley, and Bay. Well, it used the older names of it from where, like, like over in Europe and stuff like that, and I'm like, hmm, I'm like, huh. ooh, okay, I like this, and I'm, this is, like, up my alley nice. and everything, but... When it talks about Odin, Vali, and Vey, when they go to kill um, Ymir and everything, it says, they stewed Ymir and pushed his huge chunks into the Ganunda Gap. So much brine flowed from his wounds that it filled the pits and flowed over the rim. The cow and all of Ymir's offspring were drowned except for two, the very strongest Jotun and his mate. They climbed on top of an ice floe and they lived on a wild outer shores of the seas made by Ymir's brim, which is his blood, I guess, or from the brim that he licked from the cow's udders. I guess that was his blood, so to speak. Yeah. And the Asir did not pursue them. And among right away, the iceberg and the wildest wilderness of the Jotunheim were timmering uh, with their offspring. The uncouth Jotun and trolls hated the Asir for what they had done to their kingsmen and watched as the handsome gods made the new world and raged amongst themselves. And it shows like a, a nice little picture showing the Jotuns mad on that iceberg and yeah. the gods doing what they did. Like, it's really nice. Like, huh. I enjoy it. That's fascinating. Uh, I think it's an interesting thing to take away from it because, uh, uh, you know, I was born and raised in, in Christianity. So the story of Noah's flood was one that I knew very well. Um, and when you think about it, uh, the, the concept of that was destruction and rebirth, right? Wiping something out to start something new, essentially. Um, this story is a little bit different because at least so much as we know at the time, it was, it was, it, it's like primordial in, in nature. The story of Emir and being slain by Odin, Billy and Bay and, and stuff. It, it did start something new. And I guess in a way, it, I, I mean, it, it's destruction for, for new life, you know? So it's this cyclic, Re, you know, rebirth, recycling uh, thing that we see happen so much in a lot of different, you know, pagan uh, views or pagan religions or, or just cultures in general that, you know, the, the, the concept of birth uh, or rebirth, you know, 
death is not the end. It, it's a rebirth sort of thing. It, it's, not a, it's not a foreign concept in so many views and so many cultures. Um, yes, that is true because most pagans believe that to create something you must destroy it and there's a balance so to speak in um order and chaos like mm. even though bad may happen it may be for the better good even though you most likely don't want it to happen all must all things must come to an end so something better could come in its place right so to speak so yeah you know the, the the term necessary evil comes to mind and i use the term evil loosely uh because evil can i think i feel like e the, the word evil or the term evil is subjective there it, it it's it's all about perception it's you know what is universally evil what is universally good you know what is good for the i look at like you know uh what is it uh is it Morticia Adams? You know what, what is order for the spider is chaos for the fly. Yeah. Same sort of thing, you know. Like it's perception. It's 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 you know. Yeah. What is good for is one may not reality. be. Right. Yeah. So you know this necessary evil thing that I'm mentioning, where it's like, yeah, it's a, it's a necessary. It, it has to happen, you know. Like the we read about so many things in in Norse mythology and Norse lore. Um, usually, <laughs> at least in the surviving text, you know, Loki is the antagonist. Loki is the one that kind of inserts that uh, necessary destruction that, you know, that, that sudden change that, that, that caused to do something to, to, to incite a reaction, you know. Yeah. Um, but a lot of the other gods do it too. I mean, um, Odin is, is, I think, the archetype for inciting chaos for his own purposes and then and, and things to that he wants to see happen so uh yeah it's it's an interesting concept i i, I appreciate the reading and, and, and if you don't mind what was the name of the book again because i want to put that in the show notes too for people i don't I mean i don't know if it's available to for purchase anywhere for people can get a copy of it but it'd be neat to know you could get it on ebay or abe books but it is Norse Gods and Giants by, because this book's so old, like, it's by De Elori. It's D with a X, or with a dash, and then it's E-U-L-A-I-R-E-S. Got it. I think it was made by somebody in Europe. But it's a real great book like it's got all like the Norse little designs and stuff on it like you would see like in the old Norse like figures and drawings and like it draws like little things of you know all the little Norse things that you would see from the stories. yeah all the imagery yeah 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 it's really cute like my kids like it like I read it to them like on and off like I read like a chapter to them before they go to bed and they're like no we want to read more I'm like nah we gotta go to bed <laughs> like yeah. to be continued but it talks about like the gods individually and stuff like that and the creation story and it just breaks it all down like the valkyrie and the valhalla yes um, the apples of youth and um all the different uh jotun maidens and stuff like it kind of just gives it like a little bit of extra and like they make continuums of these books like of the trolls and the giants and stuff oh like, wow there's continuums of the books of that and they're real cute Hmm. I have a book, something like that, but it doesn't have any illustrations. And for anybody that's listening, that's like, what are you talking about? Like Emily's showing all this. So if you're, you're missing out by missing the, the YouTube, you know, video version of this. So again, check the show notes for those that are listening. Um, if you want to get the video version of this on YouTube, but I have a book, something similar to that. Um, and it, it's, it, there's no illustrations though, but it does, uh, it gives an interesting spin to a lot of the stories from lore. It's 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 very much delivered in a prose fashion. So you know, it kind of starts out with you know, what is Ganungagat? Where was you know what was what does that mean? And then it, you know picks up there with the creation myth, and then kind of follows a bit of a prose fashion with the rest of the mythologies. Um, but yeah, like you know how Tyr lost his hand and and the stealing of 
of of uh or you know how, how the thor and tear you know stole the the cauldron and and uh how thor you know had to retrieve his hammer and and, and so many of the other popular ones and some of the lesser popular ones some of the ones that don't always get you know mentioned or talked about um on a, on a regular basis they're they're all in there yeah it talks about all the different gods and all the stories that you would hear that like i guess like if you were just starting out like in heathenry like this would be a great book because even mm. einstein said the greatest thing to read is fairy tales and if you don't you should read more fairy tales so to speak and like to me like that book and I have another book that's like a giant book and it talks about like all the mythologies of the giants like from all different parts of the world but um oh wow um Yamar is in that one too I have a book uh I, somebody gave it to me he's like I don't got no more use for this or I've never but the thing is like four inches thick and like no lie and it's it's just mythology it's a, it's a book on the dictionary what's it called I'm, I'm looking on my bookshelf the dictionary of of mythology and it like goes into which is like all kinds of mythology not just you I know norse mythology it. yeah it's a like and, I, and i've only just skimmed through it but i'm like man some of the like the the, the comparisons or the similarities between cultures and between you know every you know all parts of the world the, the similarities sometimes are striking um what's your favorite norse story norse mythology do you have one or ones that that kind of stand out to you i really like the story of baldor when he dies and yeah when the ring starts separating and nana the death of baldor I also like the story of uh, Nertheris, which there's not very much story on her, but like if mm -hmm. you're talking about from the Poetic Edda, like it's Baldur and his Baldur, death yeah. and everything. But like if you want to talk about like an ancient Norse goddess, like or anything like that, like it would be Nertheris and her story because she's something that's very rarely talked about. And I think it's rather, I don't know, to me, it just like blows my mind because like I guess like I'm like a a nerd when it comes to like our path and everything and I want to read like anything like I don't care how dry the read is mm -hmm. or if it's like a 50 page archaeology academic paper like I want to read about this and what their theories were and what they find because you know like new findings are coming out every day every year and it's changing oh, yeah. the views of how you know people worship and you know how the need fire is and how holidays were and stuff like you think about some of the people that's been doing just groundwork and just hitting the ground running over the past five years and how much like, you know, the holidays have changed or, you know, how they see, you know, our personal will of how we do stuff, our wheelhouse of, you mm -hmm. know, how we honor the gods and how we celebrate our holidays and how we weave for it and stuff like that. Yeah, I think it's uh, I think it's a wonderful thing to see happening. Um, and how traditions are being established and built, you know, with each individual tribe, you know, because it's hard to you know universalize it here now and today. You know, so much of what we're pulling from is specific to a time, specific to a region or regions, you know, in a very specific part of the world and uh, the worldview at the time, and you know, recreating it or reconstructing it. Um, I feel like it's it's important to have a healthy mix of that and building tradition now because that's what's going to last going forward, you know. Yeah, all of that all of that historical stuff is is fascinating and it's it helps us have a place to start from and you kind of need that, you know, you got to have the roots before you can grow. <laughs> um but it it is important I feel, I feel to uh to develop our own traditions nowadays, you know, how we do things, how the tribe does things, you know, it's going to be different from tribe to tribe. And that's, that's fine. And that's, I feel like that's even the way it was, you know, not every tribe did everything the same way. Yeah, that's one um, of the things that talked about in Germania, 
when a tacit Tacitus was writing about all the different tribes, yes, they all had similarities in the way they worshiped, but at the same time, each tribe had their structure differently to what their tribe needed. And you see it in this day and time. Like when mm. I go meet a different kindred, no kindred is the same from one another because they have different structures of how they do ritual. They have different, you know, some people are more inclusive than others. And some mm. people have different views on how they do their different stuff for their kindreds and stuff. And some right. tribes are more welcoming and let anybody join for ritual. And some of them are very um, closed, closed off. off. And it's just yeah. members only. Yeah. And they only let like maybe like one guest like a year come. And that's like maybe like a friend that they've known for like a year, just depending on what it is. And every group is just so different. And especially in Texas, because like you'll meet like some, you know, Southern belle with an accent. She's sitting here talking about weaving frith and everything else and women's traditions. And I'm like, wow. Mm -hmm. like a southern heathen i'm like look at her go and she'll just sit there and giggle and laugh and then you know her you know country husband was there be like come on baby let's go drink some mead and i'm like whoa that just happened <laughs> and then you meet the city people you know they're more laid back and reserved and they're like yeah man like da, da, da. he's like you want some mead and i'm like sure thanks you know it's just yeah. every kindred and tribe is so different and to me like I don't know. I feel like a kid in a candy store. When I go meet a new tribe or a kindred, I'm like, ooh, I wonder what they're going to be like. It's right. just, just so fun to me. It's just exciting. It's like Yule. <laughs> Something like yeah. that. It's just, it just tickles me to death. I'm like, yay, I'm going to go meet another kindred. This is so right. cool. And that's something that, you know, like I said, you can't, you can't recreate, uh, recreate that uh, virtually. We were talking about that earlier, you know. Um, oh, let me join this Zoom call or let me, you know, get into this, you know, discord or, or facebook thing or whatever you know like it's it's nice and it you know fills a gap i guess somewhere along the way but there's nothing that there's nothing like you know in-person meetings and we miss it too um thankfully it seems that you know with the progress of the vaccine and all this other kind of stuff to safely and uh well mainly safely you know get people back out doing things because Look, we've all been affected by isolation and quarantine and, you know, some places of the world are still pretty, pretty locked down, you know, uh, and Maybe it's bad it's really and it's worse in other parts, of the, you know, it's, it's worse in some parts of the world than others. But, you know, I think we're moving in the right direction to, to safely reintroduce the, you know, the in-person type stuff, the, the, the meetups, the moots, you know, get to know people and build those relationships, expand our, our, uh, our kith, you know? So I did want to um, bring up something that we had on the table from last week uh, on last, the last podcast. And it was from a fellow in Idaho who goes by the name Crow. And um, I'm going to find the section of the call we may have to listen to it a little bit because before I find it, but it, it's going to be a section of the call that he he brought up something that I thought was really interesting and worth talking about. Um, if you don't mind listening to it a bit, so um, I'm going to bring it up here real quick. Like I said, uh, for those listening, we're going to revisit some of the call from from Crow last week. So Crow, if you're listening or watching or whatever, man. Um, you get a double feature <laughs> unplanned. I'm energy in gifting. Uh, let me find uh, a right. section of the call. Um, there's two of them. Um, I was thinking about that, and um, I thought that, you know, if a friend is like a well, quote unquote friend, um, is too afraid to invest like the same time and energy and to give, like, gifting you back. So, we're, what he's talking about here, uh, for those listening or watching, it, it, was, it was in reference to one of the, uh, the stanza discussions that we had last week. Today's episode is going to circulate around uh, stanza 41 from the Hava Mall. We're going to get into that towards the end of the podcast, but he's, he's going over what we talked about last week in the last um, episode, but I'm going to probably fast forward a little bit or, or skip around a little bit. So just, you guys just Back bear with me here. You have get the stanza 
41. Okay, uh, here's. Really best personifies the benefits of having such a friend that invests the same amount of like time and energy in gifting. Um, it, I'm going to be reading from the Cowboys of Mall because, well, that's just how it. Yeah, he's so we're we're going to get into the Hall of Mall uh, stanza that he's talking about here, but going at like after this section of it is is what I wanted to touch on. So we'll keep this in the back the of our minds, but I'll let him. Um, <laughs> uh, continue. But uh, it says, uh, give your friend a gift that'll matter to him. Weapons, clothes, you know the kind. The kind of giving if he gets you back. Or this kind of giving if he gets you back, sorry, will mean he'll have your back when it counts. So, yeah, I thought that kind of... <laughs> um, and as per like anything to like any other new topic or anything. Yeah, here, here's the part uh, that I was looking for. I've seen a post on some other social media, and um, there's a guy talking about how uh, he thinks the gods are, have abandoned him because he can't feel any of their presence or like anymore mm. uh, during his rituals and stuff. And somebody had answered back to that with, uh, with um, sorry, I'm trying to best to word this in my mind. Uh, that like when we first became heathen, everything's brand new to us, and we can feel the presence of the gods and the whites, and you know, veered and everything. But as time goes on, we get used to that presence, and we don't you know pick up on it as much. Um, I thought that was a very interesting answer. But uh, anyways, yeah. So I wanted to that 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 part right there is kind of what I wanted to get a little bit of dialogue built around and talk a bit about. We didn't go into it last week um, in last week's episode. This whole thing with uh, how people can feel that the gods or the sacred uh, forces are uh, or have abandoned us um i got to thinking about it and to be abandoned right to be to be to feel that that you that you've been abandoned would would suggest that at one point you felt that they were present and that they were there with you and that they were there for you or that you know so when we get these feelings of abandonment it, it, you know well this person that was here for me or he or she was there for me is now no longer here or there for me. And, 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 and we feel, I think somewhat responsible, right? It must've been something I did or, or what did I do to cause them to abandon me? You know, that sort of thing. And I wondered if Emily, if you had any uh, insight or, or thoughts about that kind of um, mindset when it comes to this religion or when it comes to heathenry um, and what your thoughts were about that. So my personal view, in my opinion, that the gods are such a way of limited access. Like, yes, when you first come to the faith mm -hmm. due to a book that you read or a movie that you watched or a TV series and you feel like, oh, this is home and you get hyped up and all that adrenaline and that those happy endorphins are running through offering I want to connect with the gods and you just have this overwhelming feeling the first time you ever weave frith with the gods to connect with them and to offer and to you know give a part of yourself as well as your offering mm. to the gods or your ancestors and you know you think if you're doing a ritual outside or giving an offering outside you know you feel the wind and you know it's the land spirits or the gods are present with us the, mm -hmm. the way the fire moves and ways because of the wind or like you know because of that need fire flowing the gods are hearing us through those embers mm -hmm. as they flow and stuff like that like i'm sitting there and i've told people you know take pictures of the fire tell me what you see and they're like oh i saw odin or i saw a rune or you know they yeah. tell me different things and i'm like we'll figure out what that means to you because the gods in a way to me leave us signs here and there mm -hmm. however i have noticed through this pandemic mental health issues have been a really big hard 
crusher on people and it made people yeah. question their faith due to depression questioning their life because the life situations you know and they blame themselves they don't understand so you know they give offerings to the gods to make things better or to help them get a sign to move forward mm. and to me it's like when it comes down to stuff it's like what's meant to be is to be but in the same time you do have a say in your own fate and with connecting yourselves with the gods in your own way like you know you don't have to offer everything you have to the gods you know sometimes little is, you know less is more and more is right less, so to speak and a lot of people forget that because they're like oh i gotta have this on my altar i gotta have this candle for this god or god it's am like literally i have a plate i light a candle and that's all i do with and with my horn of mead like it's mm -hmm. just simple like whatever i cook for dinner tonight that's what my gods and my ancestors are getting and yes mm -hmm. they show me at times when my plate's there from the next morning they don't like peas they don't like tomatoes i'm like <laughs> okay i'm like i won't give you that again you know like i am sorry i did not mean to offend my ancestors or the gods you know <laughs> right. it's just everybody has their own way of interacting with the gods like and they present themselves in different ways and there are times when I'm busy with life. I don't feel the God's present as much, you know, maybe they're busy too, just like I'm busy. I don't, yeah. you know, we can't really know it all when it comes to the gods, when it comes down to it. But there is a sense of clarity knowing that the gods or your ancestors are there, you know, because your ancestors are in your blood and your veins and in your bones, like they're there, mm -hmm. you know, but when it comes to the gods, like, it's a limited access yeah. and they'll present themselves when they're ready. Just be patient. Like not everybody, you're not, everybody's not like special. Like we're not all put on a pedestal and we're like, we get to talk to the gods every day. They're going to answer us every day and everything is going to be hunky dory. No, it's not. right. I'm sorry. It's not, it's not yeah. like that. Like not every, like we're not all special. Like we're all, you know, in, you know, the creation of things, you know, from our ancestors and stuff, but we all connect with the gods differently. Like you think about somebody that does Sather or Galder will connect with the gods differently compared to a Gothi or a Gidea or compared to a hearth mother or a man that is a warrior. They would connect with gods in different ways that some people may never, ever connect to them. And people forget that because they think they're supposed to get instant gratification. It's work. It's dedication. Like you have to give into the well. It's kind of like that, yeah. that story um, about the box. You must put into the box before you can take out of the box or the box will always be empty. Yeah. I like the, uh, the, the, uh, the, the, uh, the analysis there. Um, when, especially when you talk about, you know, how, um, the gods are uh, of, of limited access. And a uh, matter of fact, when you say that, I'm, I'm, I'm reminded of a video that Eric Shervin did about that, I believe. But it makes a lot of sense, um, especially if you look back at the way our ancient ancestors interacted with the sacred, interacted with the gods. It was at specific times in a specific way um, for a specific reason, at least so much as we know. What was done on a more, you know, uh, on a smaller scale amongst the families, amongst the clans, amongst the home, uh, we don't know because it, it wasn't documented. But what was documented and what was shared, at least, is that you know, when it was Yule or when it was Sigurdlot or when it was mid, you know, uh, winter nights or whatever the various, you know, whether it was, um, you know, Norse uh, traditions, whether it was Anglo-Saxon uh heathenry whether you know whatever how it was observed how it was done uh it was done at specific times it wasn't like well it's tuesday and let me you know uh gift to, to, to tear and now it's thursday and let me gift to thor uh it was i think it was different and we we picked up on certain modern traditions or modern things it, you know for whatever reasons you know stories we've read or you know movies we've watched or a lot of the things that you mentioned earlier you know some of the pop culture stuff that influences us and i think that like you said when when you come into heathenry new um anything 
really that you come into, you know, fresh and new, you've got that vigor, you know, you feel like there's something to be gained from this and you've, you know, you've got, uh, you know, the gods are with me, the gods walk with me, the this to that. Maybe not. Maybe you're just seeing things that are there and, you, and you're, you're taking the signs that are that are present and, and making them something that maybe they are or aren't. Who knows if that's up to, I think, us as individuals. It's the signs that come, the omens that are being read are, are meant for, you know, a specific person or, or, or a specific group even. And when it comes to feeling abandoned, you know, um, I, I felt that. I think we all have, especially like you mentioned with the, with the pandemic and mental health and everything, you know, just the whole world changed in such a short period of time and everybody was affected by that. So it's no surprise for me to hear that this was on somebody's mind or that they were talking about it. You know, what have I done wrong? Why, are, why have the gods abandoned me? You know, my life sucks. It must be I pissed the gods off or whatever. I, it's like, uh, you know, maybe you just had a string of bad luck, man. Like maybe you just made a bad decision and now you're having to deal with the, the out, the, the fallout of it. You know, it, it, it may just be that. Um, but how we reconnect, how we establish uh, a connection and maintain that uh, is, is important to understand. Um, and it can be difficult because like you say, you know, maybe the gift that I gave uh, wasn't, wasn't received. You, and you'll know, right. You'll know if it was, was, or wasn't received that, that, that specific sign will, will make itself known to you. Cause that, you know, your, your purpose, your intent behind it was to do something. And I think that if, if we have that intent behind it, uh, we'll know if we were on the right track or not, if we need to repeat that action or not. I don't know. At least that's my thoughts. <laughs> I don't know, to me, like, I go back and forth on stuff, because, like, I've been a heathen for 12 years now, and mm. I'm always half, for, half you know, the people that's been, the people that's been doing it for years and stuff like that, like, they've seen the changes, like, like, you know, I remember when I was a heathen 12 years ago, and, like, Vikings and all that stuff was, you know, starting to come out, and different things were coming out of the woodworks and stuff like that because like my first book I got was this book right here from the Poetic Edda and I got one book on Sather and the Sather book that I read was like the hardest book I thought I ever read like I thought it was bad as like a chemistry or an organic book because I just yeah. it, I just didn't understand it because I was just starting out yeah. and it took me about I think like three years until I stumbled around, around the right people and I found a women's group and they talked about, you know, Sather and Volva and what a hearth mother was and what Speakona was and, mm -hmm. you know, Spay wife and all those different things, as well as, you know, they gave me really good books to read that helped me understand, you know, like the, the Norse culture, the Norse society and different things like that to where now when I see people just starting out I'm like come here like email me like I'm gonna send you you know some books to start off with to help you out so you don't ever have yeah. to deal with the struggles that I did because it took mm. me forever and then finally like the niche just came across and like now I'm good and I could just you know when people talk about stuff I'm like yeah such and such just from this book in this chapter it's like what did you need to know about it? Like, did you have a dream or did you, did you see like a, a vision? Like what happened? Like, please tell me so I could help you and stuff like that. Cause like, yeah, I don't practice Sather, but I read about Sather and, you know, I sit there and, you know, do rune readings occasionally for people that want them or whatever, you know? And like when the kindred got started, like I had to learn about, you know, kindred because I got elected as the Gidea. And I was mm. just like, wow, because I had been the person that had been there the longest. And they were like, we want you to do it because it was between like me and one other person. Mm -hmm. And he had already had a kindred and it didn't go very well. So they were like, well, you're like a mom. You could nurture the kindred. And I'm like, oh, <laughs> we're going to see it that way. Okay. I'm like, I got you. Like, I yeah. will nurture this kindred and I'll I'll like, I'll tell you what I think and we could just roll with it. Because one of the things I've noticed about kindreds is like, you know, whoever the main person is will 
and it's like, hey, we're going to do this, and everybody's like, yeah, yeah, let's go do this, like, with me, you know, like, I had to tell everybody, like, give me a year to get everything down, I want to go meet other kindreds, and see how their kindred works, and I want to figure out how I think will be best for our kindred for what works for us, because I had to start from scratch, like, I was calling people all the way up from, like, Wisconsin, asking questions, talking to people that had had, like, a women's kindred, for years Mm -hmm. and then I've talked to people down in Texas and you know from Little Rock and all different places like all the way from Norway just asking them questions about like you know things that they did and you know like hey can I join one of your rituals to see how y'all do stuff to see how I wanted to do it for our kindred not by copying what they do but to find what works for us and it took me about a year and once I got that all settled and everything like everybody in the kindred like loves how we do stuff and like I always tell them like hey I wrote this ritual what do y'all think? And they're like, they'll read and they're like, yeah, that's great. Let's do that. Can we do this God instead? I'm like, sure, we can do that. And then we just roll with it. Like I let them choose what they want to do. Like I'm not the boss. Like I'm just there to do ritual for them because, you know, that's something that nobody's really good at and they want me to mm-hmm. do it. Yeah. You have to fill a specific so, role. It's just really interesting. But yeah. I just filled a void that everybody needed because it was so weird two years ago. Everybody was complaining that there was no kindred in Texarkana and they were like, let's start a kindred. And I'm like, whoa, now, like, do y'all know how much work this is? Like, it's not like something that happens overnight. Like it takes years for it just to get its roots set into the ground. So the kindred yeah. doesn't implode or fall over on a windy day, you know, right. it's a lot more than what y'all think it is. And I'm like, and I'm going to have to do a lot of traveling to figure out, you know, what I what would be best for the kindred and stuff because you know we have a lot of different people in the kindred and you know it was so new for me and I was so lucky to meet the people that I did like I met Eric and I um you know I've you know met you and I met people from um oh where were they from uh Little Rock and then I met a couple other people that uh were friends of Eric's that made made the experience even more you know knowledgeable for me to help the kindred and stuff because there was stuff that I needed to know more about that I had gaps with, because we have so many gaps in heathenry, because there's stuff that's missing from history, and to me, it just, it just drives me nuts, and when I see new people just starting out, I'm like, come here, like, let me send you an email, and I'm gonna send you some books, so you don't have the problems that I had for the past, you know, beginning of my heathen journey, you know, so you can grow and prosper, so you could be good in five years, instead of taking 10 years, almost, (laughs) Yeah, there's, 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 there's so much, yeah, there, 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 there's so much information uh, readily available and, and easily accessible, just a little bit of work, you know, just takes a little bit of work, you don't have to be a college professor or have access to, you know, uh, uh, an exclusive library, so there's so much out there and it, and it, and, you know, takes just a little bit of work, but um, the real work comes when you apply it, you know, so yeah. again, with like, you know, you know, the feelings of abandonment or, the, you know, uh, not feeling the God's presence. Um, I guess, you know, I, it wasn't like eliciting a response. Pro's message wasn't necessarily asking for, well, what do you think? But it, as a discussion point, I feel like it's important to, uh, everything's, it's, it, it's relative, you know what I mean? Uh, the feelings that we're having in times like that, um, if you're feeling abandoned by the gods or that the gods have abandoned us or whatever, it, it's probably not that so much as it is just hit a bump in the road, you know, yeah. um, find the thing that, uh, reestablishes a connection with the sacred. The gifting cycle has always been the, the, the way that we tie weird with the tribes of the gods. It's the way our ancestors did it, uh, through the gifting cycle. It's how we, weave breath and how we tie uh you know connections with our folk and with our people is through the gifting cycle whether it be you know material things or time or like you're talking about information you know being willing and able to want to share in knowledge and exchange and that sort of thing stuff like this i feel is you know even though it's virtual even though it's on a you know a podcast or a youtube video or whatever like this is this is there, there's value to it, at least on some level. Um, and don't get so, I, I've talked about this before, before we get into the Hava Mall, because um, we're going to be wrapping up the podcast here soon. But, you know, 
worry about your folk, worry about your ancestors more so than the gods. Like the gods are there. The gods are, like you said, the gods are busy. They do their thing. We do ours. Um, how we connect with them, the way we connect with them, find that way and stick with it. It doesn't have to be a daily thing, you know? I mean, to be honest with you, I have some really good friends, people who are like kin to me. Um, but I would get tired of their asses if they showed up every day and just wanted to do, you know what I mean? Like sometimes you just need a break. Sometimes you're just like, all right, dude, I'll talk to you next week. Or I'll talk to you tomorrow or whatever. Like you don't have to just keep knocking on my door, sending me messages or whatever. It's on a similar scale. I'm not trying to compare uh, those types of relationships with the gods because again, it's sacred space, profane space. There's that, there's that whole thing. That's a whole other podcast. That's a whole other discussion. <laughs> you, you know what I mean? Yeah, there's different layers but, of that. There's like for sure. your inner circle of your hearth and then the outer with you know, the friends and the acquaintances and then the people right. you just you just won't let into your house. It's like somebody knocks on the door, you're like, go away. You yeah, know, why are you knocking on my door? I didn't invite you over. It's like, you didn't call it's me. Like, how did you make it to my property? Like I live out in the middle of nowhere. Like, are you lost? It's like go home. Yeah. I miss it's like, that. If you're not FedEx, go home. <laughs> if I didn't order something through Amazon and you didn't call me ahead of time and even then right Amazon will let you know hey I'm seven yeah. stops away I'm six stops away I just dropped it off at your door but at least they're giving you head to you know if somebody just randomly yeah, shows like, up it, it's just like I think you're lost buddy yeah but so um oh, man that's another thing since the pandemic and ordering stuff online and you get a package and you're like what did I order <laughs> yeah Oh, I ordered this, you know, it's like a Christmas year ago. Or something, or Yule. It's like, wait, is it my birthday? Like, who sent me something? I'm like, oh, wait, I sent it to myself. <laughs> yeah. It just delayed in shipping for, you know, now we got the gas shortage. I don't know if you guys out there are, are affected by it. Uh, I don't even want to All talk about that. Idiots panic All buying stuff. Yeah. Putting stuff in plastic and then they're like using styrofoam. I'm like, what are y'all trying to do? You're best buying things that you you so so you're you're panic buying, but also you're 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 trying to you're not trying to, but there are people out there that are literally buying quantities of perishable things like it's and they're using perishable. plastic to put it. In yeah, buy, yeah, like this stuff's gonna eat right through it. Like, I'm like, are you trying to use make your head? Fire, or are you trying to start your car on fire? Because this like, is how you, you to... yeah. You want napalm because like, this is how you get napalm. Yeah, it's you know? like, oh, <laughs> natural selection is hitting home runs today. Like somebody's going to get a Darwin. Grand or... slams. I'm like, mm. Grand I'm slams. Like, yeah. Mm-mm. All right. So with everything, this has been great, by the way. So thank you again. Um, <laughs> with everything that we've. Well, thank uh, you for having me. I feel very honored. <laughs> well, it's great. I th- and thank you for the for the kind words. Uh, with the with the Havamal stanza 41, um, as everybody knows that listens or watches, um, I read from various translations, but you actually have a translation that I don't think I've familiar with, or at least have heard of. So if you wouldn't mind, I would like to have you start yeah. the that yeah, and, and an let the Oxford folks know. Edition. Oxford edition. Mm-hmm. All right. Well, who like yeah, give us some detail and 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 fire away. Let us know the uh, you know the deets. Spill right. the deets. This is the Poetic Edda, a new translation by uh Caroline Larrington. And I've had this copy, I don't know, for about it was my first book I bought 12 years ago. And I really enjoy it because the way it breaks it down, it's real simple. It's not um I guess it's not extra wordy like like you know how Jackson Crawford stuff like he lays it out really well and it's uh Mm -hmm. what I call extra wordy like he uses like extra words that you wouldn't hear being used in like old Norse terms but it's in a Mm -hmm. modern day view like this one's very cut and dry and it is what it is and it's the um Oxford world classics and this is what it looks like y'all can see it is that who's that on the cover there? Is that Thor? Is that Thor or is that a Freyr statue on there? Yeah. I think it is Thor. It's got it cut would, off at the bottom, so you can't see. Oh, uh, okay. It. Yeah, the bottom is the key. Yeah. The bottom would be the giveaway, but it looks like he's holding. Yeah, he's he's definitely holding a hammer. Yeah. So that's yeah, Thor. If it was, like, was Freyr, it'd be something Thor. else. 
Yeah, it'd be a golden phallusk, but we're not going to talk about that. <laughs> no. But so we're on stanza 41. Yes. Right? Yep. All righty. So it says, with weapons and gifts, friends should gladden one another. This is mostly. Um, oh, wow. Mutual givers and receivers are friends for longest if the friendship is going to work at all. All right. So that's a great version. I'm going to read a few versions here. Well, more than just a few. So, um, and then we'll go into a bit of a discussion around, uh, around this and the meaning of it and uh, analyze it a little bit before we wrap it up. So I'll start with the Auden and Taylor version which says with presence friends should please each other with a shield or a costly coat mutual giving makes for friendship so long as life goes well uh, the bellows translation is the friends shall gladden each other with arms and garments as each for himself can see gift givers friendships are longest found if fair their fates may be got Oliver Bray, which is with raiment and arms shall friends gladden each other. So has one proved oneself for friends last longest, if fate be fair, who give and give again. Hollander, which is arguably one of my favorite um, versions, just the way the cadence of it. With presence, friends should please each other with a shield or a costly coat. Mutual giving makes for friendship so long as life goes well. Thorpe is with arms and vestments. Friends should each other gladden. Those which are in themselves most sightly. Givers and requiters are longest friends if all else goes well. And then lastly, I will always uh, share from Jackson Crawford's uh, The Wanderers, call them all. Um, and he always has like, you know, the Norse, old Norse variation of it, but his version reads friends should provide their friends with weapons and clothing, this kind of generosity shown generous mutual giving is the key to lifelong friendship. So it's interesting, right, that we were talking about before, um, this how it segues into the, the health of all discussion about the gifting cycle and how important it is. Uh, and this is a common theme that we see in the health of all actually, uh, and across, you know, Norse heathenry in, in, uh, as, as a whole, the value of giving gifts. Um, and you mentioned a brief, uh, briefly earlier, you know, not to give too much, you know, certain things you give uh, or give too often. So it's not in the Hava Mall, but it's uh, somewhere else in the poetic at one of the other um, one of the other poems, uh, which I can't remember which one it is. You might be able to help me out, but it's it it, it references how uh, it might be the Hava Mall. I could be wrong, but it's 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 basically saying you know don't give too much. You can give too much, uh, give too little. There's there's uh, I'm trying to remember what it is, but the, the 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 general gist of it is is you know it's it's better to not give at all than to give too much. Um, but I think one of the things to take away from this, you know, is is giving gifts um, and receiving gifts, um, the sense of obligation that comes with gift giving. Um, too many times nowadays, I feel that people feel like they can buy their friendship. Or, you know, um, buy their favor, you know, oh, if I give a good gift, he's going to really like me or, or, you know, if I buy them drinks all the time, you know, they're, they're, we're going to be friends forever. Um, and that's a short term, you know, sort of thing. It's, it's the intent behind it all has to be, has to be pure. And that's where true friendship um, comes in, I think, because a gift given will be followed by a gift received in some way or fashion because 
the sense of obligation that comes with this action is that, wow, I've been given something of such great value that in order to maintain the, the bonds of Frith, I now have to reciprocate. And I've talked about it in other podcasts and videos before how obligation is not a is not something that we should shun away from as heathens. Obligation doesn't mean that it's not a bad thing. It's 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 necessary and it's a good thing um, to maintain healthy friendships and healthy relationships. Um, so we want to give freely, our um, and our friends would give freely back to us. Those those true friends. Uh, and I feel like it, it has a place in our relationship with the gods as well. You know, what we do in our offerings, what we do in bloat or whatever you call it, um, we, we are expecting some sort of return, right? We are doing steps A, B, and C in anticipation of a return gift or a return gesture. Um, and that's I, how I feel, you know, again, kind of building off of the, the concern or the question about what do we do or, or, or you know, how do you uh, deal with the feelings of abandonment? I feel like that's how you deal with it. You reestablish that. You, you start the gifting cycle. You, you give a gift, your intent uh, to, to, to receive things back. It's, it has to start with something. So anyway, that's my that's my take on it. What's what's yours? So when it comes to friendships, because my background's kind of odd, because I never grew up with friends as a child, and I actually didn't really make friends until like after I had children. And I guess like because I became like more into my faith and different things, the right people came into my life that were supposed to be my friends instead of the people that were, I guess you know, so mundane like they would have never got me. You know what I mean? Like. The yeah. people that are meant to be in your lives are the ones that are meant to stay. And, you know, there's the ones that, you know, it's like, I love you from afar type of people. It's like, you know, mm -hmm. see you like once every six months kind of stuff. And the way I've always shown friendship is like, I would invite somebody, you know, over, you know, cook them dinner and stuff. Cause that's what I do. I'm a mom. I have to cook, you know, several mm -hmm. meals a day. Cause I've got little heathens that are always hungry. They're just like, feed me blueberries, strawberries, you know, fix mm -hmm. me noodles. It's just always something has to be fixed all the time. Yeah. So with me as a gift, giving food or making mead and giving them as a gift to my friend be like hey you want to try a bottle of my meat and like you know I give it as a gift to one of my friends you know asking for nothing in return but sometimes <sighs> gifts doesn't really have to be a physical thing it could just be a presence like you know just for somebody to come over and eat dinner with me even though I gift them with a meal and mead their presence is a gift to me in return just mm. to have that friendship you know it can be mentally physically or spiritually like, you know, when people show up for ritual, that's the greatest gift to somebody that wants to come to ritual. You know, the people that want to weep for it, the people that need it. And for me, you know, having a ritual, it's a gift to them because that's what they need. And it hmm. just kind of, it exchanges itself in such a silent way. Like it doesn't have to be physical. It can yeah. be mental, mentally or spiritually. And people forget that because we live such in a materialistic world and we want instant gratification. Like we want everything now. We want our friendship now. Like we want cool things now. And we think that, oh, this is how it's supposed to be. Like when I go out to eat and I invite a friend, I'm like, hey, you want to go out to eat with me? When I know straight up I invited somebody to come eat with me, I'm going to pay for their meal because that's hospitality. I'm not going to expect yeah. them to pay for their own meal. Like that's rude. And maybe they'll invite me one day and in return the same, even though I don't expect it, or they'll just invite me to come over and hang out with them. Everybody has their own way of gift exchange. Yeah. You know, like me and my best friend, she's like, can you make me some of your soap? It's like, and we could hang out and read one of your books and hang out together, you know, and we could talk mm -hmm. about stuff. And I'm like, okay. And, you know, her visiting me is a gift enough for me and she's getting soap out of it. So it just kind of works its way around. And like, you know, she started a new um, college stuff and I've been trying to, you know, be more interested in what she's doing. So I've been buying her stuff for, you know, to go with her college stuff that would um, make her classes easier, you know, like a, a candle or, you know, some type of chakra thing that she needs mm -hmm. trying to, you know, feed the gift of what she's wanting to do 
in turn for our friendship because she matters to me you know my kids love her and stuff like that yeah and you know every there's some people that you know the gift that they need is to be set straight because the world's attacking them and they need to be told how it is so they could get through the day you know so they could feel better you know everybody has their own way and I'm pretty sure I call people at times to just you know check myself about something that happened so I'm not making sure that you know everything's going to be all right and I'm not you know overthinking it like everybody has their own ways of gifting you yeah know. and value <laughs> the value okay. of a gift yeah the value of a gift is is I believe um placed on the person receiving it you know yeah everybody so I has think- their own weight of what a gift is to somebody it's the scales right. of I guess happiness so to speak for one person it may be a materialistic object and for somebody else it may be just the presence of a friend sometimes it's the little things that make things go farthest than true mind. yeah absolutely well this has absolutely been a, a blast um and I want to say thank you again for for uh you know being a part of it it's always fun to have guests on here and and hear other people's you know views on things and uh offering their insight thank you for sharing the the book was it norse was it norse gods and goddesses uh norse gods and giants norse gods and giants so i'm going to um have information on the book uh in the podcast show notes and also in the description of the video for those that are youtube members watching so once again be sure to check out all the details about how you too can become a member of Midgard Musings and see the video version of the podcast. So I want to thank Emily um, for joining me today. Uh, Thank you for taking time out of your evening to come on here. It's been an honor. Um, And for everybody else out here listening and watching, thank you for your ongoing support. Remember to please follow Midgard Musings on all the social media. It's Facebook, Twitter, YouTube. Check out the show notes or description for all the other ways that you can support the channel, the podcast. You guys know the drill. So until we talk again, hail, and may all of your hearth fires continue to burn bright. Helen, thank you. <laughs>